the electrons, which are the beta particles, and it ends up with another lead isotope, 207. Okay, here's a thorium, which is an element that's close to uranium, thorium-232. It's got an extremely long half-life, 13 billion years. We're getting almost to the limits of the age of the universe with this half-life as far as evolutionists say, right? 13 billion years, that's way out there. Again, helium nuclei, beta particles, a new uh, lead isotope, 209, being formed. And then here's another, the last example here is polonium-241. It's got a reasonably short half-life compared to these 2.4 million years. And that undergoes the same kind of transition, helium nuclei, which are alpha particles, beta particles, and polonium goes to bismuth, 209. So these are simply examples of different characteristic isotopes. And an isotope decay rate, or its half-life, can be oh, enormously different from one type of isotope to another. We can have these long half-lives like we have here in the billions and millions of years, or we can have them in the microseconds or the nanoseconds, extremely short half-lives. So it varies all over the map depending upon the type of nucleus. Now, how do we radiometric date? Well, first of all, we have some assumptions. The first assumption is no radioactive daughter product elements would be present at the start. Because if that were true, and we're measuring how much is there as a, uh, an indicator of the decay process, then we'll be messed up to begin with, right? Okay? So that's very important that no daughters were present at the start. Number two, no loss or gain of any daughter or parent, either one, in the process. In other words, if there's anything that could happen by a physical change, in the environment of that decay process over the period of time in which it's supposed to happen that could change the amount of elements as either daughter or parent elements in the ratios that they were originally, then we would have a problem. The assumptions would have to be true, these assumptions, or else we'd have a problem. Very important, the decay rate has to be constant, otherwise we have no way of knowing how to measure the beginning and the end with any degree of reliability, because we have, we have no way of doing that. This is what we're keying on today, the measurement of the decay rate. These other matters, they have been dealt with in detail by a number of investigators. They've been reported in depth by the uh, rate project of ICR. If you have any of those proceedings, uh, those books, you may want to look at that. And they have numerous uh, uh, amounts of uh, evidence to show that there's no reason to believe that either this condition nor this condition could even be valid at any time in the history of the Earth. Okay? So we're going to address the constancy of decay rates. Now, what are some of the examples that we have to deal with? Well, we have, for example, from volcanic ash. We have potassium argon dating, where potassium, I'll show you later in more detail, but a potassium isotope 40 decays to two things. It decays to calcium and it decays to argon. Well, argon's a gas, and that's the one that they key on because it's the one that they can determine and at least hopefully presume that the conditions that are necessary will be met because if they try to use calcium, there's calcium all around in those rocks, and they'll never have any chance of using the calcium as a measurement index. Mount St. Helens, when did that happen? 1986 was the top of the uh, action there. Guess what those rocks dated? 0.35 to 2.8 million years. Pretty bad, I'd say. Kilea, Hawaiian volcano, a little less than 200 years ago. From zero to 22 million years. Some of them are zero because they couldn't date them with any reliability. But they went all the way up to 22 million years. Certainly much, much older than 200 years, right? Uh, Hello Lea, which is, of course, known between 1800 and 1801. That went from 160 million to 3.3 billion years in dating the volcanic ash from those rocks. So these are the references from which this data is obtained. You can check them out if you want. And there are numerous other references that would also attest to that. Now, here's a statement made by Stanfield. 
And it's a very important statement because he's an evolutionist. And notice what he says. It is obvious that the radiometric techniques may not be the absolute dating methods they are claimed to be. And age estimates on a given geological stratum by different radiometric methods are often quite different, sometimes by hundreds of millions of years. Absolutely. Very definitely. In fact, most of the time, depending upon which samples you use, if you don't selectively isolate your samples to fall in all in the same range, and you just do ramble sampling by any kind of randomness, 